Hello, and welcome to the 25th session in our webinar series with the Alliance for Water Efficiency. WaterSense and AWA started the series in 2015, and we have had 24 successful webinars to date. All of our webinars have been recorded and are available for on-demand viewing for those of you that are not able to join us during the live session. We're just gonna cover a few housekeeping topics before we jump into the presentation. All attendees were muted when they entered the webinar to minimize background noise. To ask questions, you can type those in the questions box and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. And finally, a recording of this presentation will be available on the WaterSense website and AWE's YouTube channel following the presentation. So we'd like to start by launching a few polls. So we're going to launch two polls at the same time. The first question is, who do we have on the call today? And the second question, what part of the country are you calling from? All right, thanks so much for those answers. It looks like we mostly have local and state government uh, representatives on the call today, followed by irrigation professionals and water utilities. And then most people are calling from the West, which is also where I am located, followed by the Southeast and then Southwest and Midwest were tied and a few people from the Northeast. Thanks so much. So today's webinar topic is water savings with WaterSense labeled homes. Changes to the WaterSense labeled homes program have opened new opportunities for communities seeking to meet consumer demand for green homes. This webinar is going to provide an overview of the WaterSense home specification and certification and also share experiences from local governments incentivizing WaterSense and water smart homes. The session will also be discussing how the WaterSense specification for homes can be met by reducing water used outdoors. Our speakers today are Jonah Sheen, Olga Cano, and Sarah Lavoie with EPA's WaterSense program. Jonah is the National Program Manager for Homes and Buildings at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Water Program and currently the Acting Branch Chief of the WaterSense program. He has overseen the technical development and implementation of WaterSense labeled homes program since its inception, in addition to numerous efforts to better understand and influence water use in the field. He holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor's of Science degree from Indiana University, as well as a Master's of Science in Environmental Science from the Johns Hopkins University. Olga is an environmental engineer with the Homes Program for the WaterSense Program. She is involved in the development and implementation of the WaterSense Homes Specification and Certification System. And Olga holds a BA in Architecture from Florida International University, as well as a Master's of Science in Environmental Engineering from Michigan Tech. And Sarah is an Environmental Protection Specialist with the WaterSense Outdoor Program. She works with the technical team on new outdoor specifications and coordinates with professional certifying organizations to develop resources that promote water efficient practices with industry and the public. Sarah has a master's degree in public affairs and environmental science, both focusing on water resource management from Indiana University. And she also holds a bachelor's degree from the Ohio State University. And with those introductions, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to Jonah. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, so we're here today to talk about the Water Sense Labeled Homes Program, which we've actually had as part of the Water Sense Program since way back in 2009. However, we are now in version two of the program and have been since 2022. So in version one of the program, which was the first national certification uh, for, for, water, for water efficiency, we used a variety of techniques. Since 2022, uh, in version two, we've moved to more of a performance-based approach where homes have to be at least 30% more efficient compared to code-built homes, uh, code -built, new code-built homes. They're all third-party certi certified using existing certification stru structure, which, which is overseen by EPA. 
So that's important as you're here from Olga because it really helps keep the cost of the certification down as low as possible and make it as accessible as possible to builders and communities without compromising on the efficiency or the performance. So through that system, we're able to offer more flexibility than we were in, in version one while maintaining or even increasing the, the, the efficiency. We're also able to provide a consistent, comprehensive template to, to building uh, new homes. I wanna be clear, we will actually certify existing homes, but like a lot of green building programs, green building certifications, we're really focused on new construction. Um, and as I said, that lets us provide a consistent template that responds to market and climate changes. So I wanna be clear, that doesn't necessarily mean that the home is exactly the same, but it's the same process that a builder has to, has to go through. So they're able to develop some efficiencies, even if they only build in one, uh, in one metropolitan area, but work across several utilities or several jurisdictions. We go to the next slide, please. So the reason that we're able to really key in, key in on this efficiency and why we wanted to move to a percent reduction based certification program is because it can be a little tricky to wrap your head around this concept, but water use in homes is simultaneously extraordinarily variable and extraordinarily predictive at the same time. So if we take these two, uh, two homes, which I've used as an example, uh, the home on the left has, um, uh, if you look at the end uses of the home, it puts outdoor water use at about 25% of, to of total consumption, whereas the home on the right has way more closer to 55, 60% outdoor water use in terms of its total consumption. And if I showed you those two profiles uh, just in general, you would probably say, well, that makes sense. They're probably from different climates. And in, in this example, that's exactly what I've done. I've taken more or less uh, two very, very similar homes, but from different climates and shown you how water use is very different in, in each of those. So the home on the left, if you wanna get to 30% more efficient, you probably have to focus way more on indoor water use, whereas the home on the right, you may wanna you may want to focus a lot more on outdoor water use because that's simply where the savings exist. If we go to the next slide, um, so these in this instance, these these homes have almost the exact same uh, distribution of water use in terms of indoor outdoor, but they're actually from the exact same climate. They're just two very very different homes. One's a 2,500 2, square foot home. Um, on a 4,400 square, square foot lot. The other is a 1,000 square foot home on a quarter acre lot. Now you might say those are not necessarily what we see typically built in our jurisdiction. And that may be true, uh, but at the same time, they're both well within the norms of what we see in new, con in new construction. But again, the point is that we can cue into the, to what makes these homes different. And the fact that they're using water very differently is very predictable based on the types of home, homes they are. So this is really what we're trying to cue into in version two. We're trying to figure out what makes the most sense and what would help, what, where a builder can put their limited resources to make a, to make a home as water efficient as possible while, while, while uh, uh, using a limited amount of, while limiting the amount of incremental costs we might experience from the home. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, I do want to point out that one of the cool things is we we don't just put this out and model it and hope for the best. We do actually go out into the field and try to check and make sure that it's working. So with version two, which I mentioned, we, we fully implemented in 2022, but we started piloting it in the Las Vegas region going back to 2020. In Las Vegas, uh, typical new, we'd see typical new construction usually use about 97,000 gallons of water per year because it is, after all, the desert. Um, and, and water use is high, despite the substantial uh, conservation efforts that have, have taken place in the region. Whereas the water sense labeled homes that we, that we certified as part of the pilot used a median water use of 44,000 gallons of, wa of water per year. So significant savings, uh, which, we're, which we're really happy about. At that rate, you, you can um, fit about three and a half homes uh, um, per uh, on you know, supplied with an acre foot of water per year compared to what might be normally be like three or four what we typically see in the West. So we 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 really feel great about um, the fact that homes are performing the way that we expect them to, and the program seems to be returning good results. If you're interested in reading this full report, it is available on our website. If we go to the next slide, please. 
Uh, and again, I do want—I just want to share one more piece from this from this study, which really underscores this uh, this idea that water use is simultaneously variable but also predictive. Um, on the y-axis here, we have metered consumption, so uh, actual water use that we observe based on the utility water meters in the field, and the x-axis is the prediction, right? So the, what we what we thought based on the performance model that the homes would use. So if the model were, were perfectly predictive, you'd see a completely diagonal line. Um, we don't necessarily expect to see that because once again, we expect to see that variability in um, uh, along the y-axis where some homes use a lot of water, some homes barely use any at all. But in general, you can see we do a pretty good job of capturing which home is likely to use more water, more water than others. Again, you're always gonna have these, um, these sort of uh, uh, not necessarily outliers, but extreme circumstances. Uh, I think when we dug into it, a lot of the dots along very low on the y-axis that barely used any water were second homes. A lot of the uh, dots that were very high on the y-axis and way outside the range were places where people were running like businesses out of their homes, like home daycares or things like that. Um, so you're always going to see that. But again, uh, Long term, we actually do a pretty good job keying into what drives water use and which homes are going to use more or less than the others. Next slide, please. Um, and this is why we think it's really important from a community perspective, is that because there's, there's always technologies, there's always ways to get additional water supplies, but it can be really, really expensive. So if you have 50,000 acre feet of water as a community, you can either go out and get, and you, you're at capacity and you want to grow, uh, which most communities want to do. They want to add housing. They want to uh, add to their to their tax base. They want to do all the great things that come with growth, but you're at your 50,000 acre feet per year limit. Well, again, you can go out and you can spend all of that money, do all those really expensive uh, time intensive, resource intensive things to get more water water resources, or you can take that that water and you can stretch it a little bit a little bit further. And when you do when you start looking at it on a community level, it really becomes quite substantial. So that 50,000 acre feet at 146 um, thousand gallons of water per year, which is right around where we think uh, stock um, housing based on the the most recent residential end uses of water study uh, is nationally, that would get us a little over 100,000 homes supported on 50,000 acre feet of water per year. If we go to the um, uh, 97,000 uh, gallons of, wa of water per year, uh, per home per year, that we saw in typical new construction in Las Vegas. That's about um, 135,000 homes. If we take it down a little bit more by incorporating things like water sensitive level products, that would take it down to 94,000 uh, uh, gallons of water per year. That would put us in the range of 170 or so, so thousand homes. Well, if we bring that all the way down to, to 53,000 gallons of water per year, which is the average that we saw in that study, we're over 300,000 of homes based on the same amount of water. So like I said, really substantial when we start to look at it at the community level. If we go to the next slide. Um, so again, clearly it's important to communities. And I always like to say that water right now in regards to the building industry is really sitting at the middle of three crises. Uh, number one, we have drought. Uh, we had a good winter, and so that's really sort of made this map look a lot better than it did a few months ago. But of course, drought's going to come back in the West. We also, even though we don't think about it, it is an issue that we deal with in places like here or the upper Midwest. So drought's an issue that we're going to have to deal with and communities are going to have to deal with. Next slide. Uh, number two is infrastructure, right? This is something else that you've probably heard, and maybe a lot of you have seen graphs like this that I have on, on this slide, which is just showing the cost of water relative to other goods and services. Um, so people often look at this and they say, wow, cost of water is going up so much, and that's absolutely correct. What I think they um, maybe get wrong some of the times is that they tend to attribute this to water shortages and droughts and things like that, when in fact, I think the data shows most of this increase is being driven by infrastructure costs. Right, So our infrastructure is old, it's getting older, we're having to spend a lot of money and a lot of resources to, to update that infrastructure. And then finally, next slide please, uh, we are in a housing crisis. Uh, so on this slide, the, the blue bars represent the number of households uh, that we add each year, this is 2010 through 2020. The orange bar represents the uh, number of uh, new units that we add each year. So 
you don't have to be, you know, a genius in economics to, to see that we haven't built homes as quickly as we've added households. In fact, between 2010 and 2020, we added about 4 million more households than we did housing units. So that's part of what's contributed to the, to the cost of housing and the sort of dearth of supply we have um, at the present moment. And just to make, make it sure that we don't let the building industry off the hook, the green line that I've put in there is productivity. Um, it has a reference of 2006. So basically what that's telling us is that um, uh, the, the building industry has been relatively static in productivity. We're no more efficient at building homes today than we were two or three decades ago. And that's a problem. So if we can go to the next slide. And then, so then again, we've got water sitting at the middle of these three, three crises. I don't know any way we can address the housing uh, crisis without adding more housing because yes, data says we do not have enough uh, units available, but of course that's going to put more burden on our limited water supplies and on our infrastructure. We can move to the next slide. Um, so we think that means that water sense labeled homes brings a lot of benefits to communities because there really is no better chance to get maximum efficiency for minimal incremental cost than at new construction. Now, let's be clear, right? That the country is mostly built, right? There's about 130 million homes in this country, country and maybe we build a million a year. So we do have to do, we do have to work on existing homes, but it's always gonna be more costly and we're never gonna make them quite as efficient as we're going to be able to make new homes where not only is the cost limited, but there's options on the table for new construction that are just not available for a um, uh, for retrofit project. Next slide. And then on the other side of things, uh, we have to look at, well, why does water sense labeled homes matter for builders and developers? Uh, I make myself put this point, this point first, right? That first and foremost, a, a home that's water efficient and high performing is a better value for the home buyer. It's a better house offers cost savings, it offers increased comfort, it increases quality. Um, again, we think we feel like our program uh, delivers on those savings and the performance, but also allows some flexibility for the builder to, to work in their practices and their specific market. But increasingly, one of the things we're hearing from a lot of our builders is that water has really become an important part of the land entitlement process. So um, it's a really important part of the uh, process of getting um, the right to build or the right to connect to, to, uh, to water services. Frequently, uh, water service connections is the reason of whether or not a site is viable for, for a new project, whereas that's not usually the case with, uh, say, energy, uh, for example. The other thing we're hearing specifically from a lot of our builders that are, have uh, public investment or that are investor-owned uh, uh, builders um, is that disclosures in ESG reporting are increasingly becoming an important part of what they do. Uh, I think, I know ESG has sort of become synonymous with um, sustainability reports and all this very feel good stuff, but at its core, I think it's important to, rem to remember that ESG reporting is meant to report and to protect investors. So when big investment firms ask for this from home builders, what they're looking at is the risk that, uh, that water resources and the abil ability to build homes in water stressed parts of the country poses to a builder and to their investment. And then the, the final point I want to make is that there's a lot of talk in the building industry and, and uh, a lot of places right now about decarbonizing. If we can go to the next slide, um, I think that uh, we can see that we have to make water part of the decarbonization dis discussion because the fact is it takes a lot of energy to keep these communities supplied with water. So I just put up some uh, quick numbers of uh, uh, general estimates that we use on the national level of how much it takes to extract, convey, treat, and deliver water, as well as heat it and, uh, and, treat, the, and treat the wastewater. Significant portion of our electric grid and a significant opportunity for energy savings can be seen through using water more efficiently. So if we can go to the next slide, I will hand it over to my colleague Olga to talk a little bit more of the details of the Water Sense Labeled Homes Program version two. Excellent. Thank you, Jonah. Um, so now that we have an overview about the importance of water sense uh, labeled homes, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through um, what the technical requirements are to achieve certification. And then um, 
we are going to get a little bit more into the weeds about uh, the outdoors aspect of, of the certification. Um, so let's get started. Next. So the our checklist is pretty straightforward. Um, we really have shifted from a, a prescriptive path to a performance based certification and simplified our checklist. And so what we have done is uh, we have a requir mandatory requirement saying that uh, we expect no water sense labeled homes to have any leaks throughout the home. Essentially, what that means is that we should not be able to um, find leaks at any of the water connections. So anywhere where plumbing products are being connected uh, or appliances that receive water, uh, there should be no visible leaks. Um, and then in addition to no leaks, uh, we are saying that all water sense, all plumbing products are installed uh, be water sense labeled. And that includes our toilets, uh, bathroom sink faucets and shower heads. One question that is pretty common uh, on our checklist is asking why it has to be water sense versus uh, simply low fixture um, plumbing products. The answer to that is that um, water sense products do go through a third party verification and they are tested for both performance and efficiency. Um, we can't say that about the low flow fixtures. And so um, the label is really the, the one way that we can uh, assure that there's going to be um, that the homeowner is going to be satisfied with what is installed. The um, second requirement is a, an efficient an efficiency requirement, and it is um, thirty percent more efficient than typical new construction. Um, what this is saying is that the, a home uh, will have to be at least thirty percent, or will have to save at least thirty percent more water compared to typical homes. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we calculate this. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yes, 30%. The way that we have established this is um, we have shifted from having one program administrator to now opening the program to what we refer to as home certification organizations. And so these organizations as part of their application process can submit a, um, uh, an approach or a type of uh, tool or model in which they calculate uh, water efficiency. What we do on our end is we test out um, this model. So for instance, one of our HCOs is ResNet. Um, they use a tool called um, HERS H2O, uh, which calculates water efficiency. And so we run that model on our end and we make sure um, that various scenarios of, of homes um, are achieving that 30% efficiency. Um, just to mention our other HCOs, we have uh, Cheers, which is a California-based home certification organization, so they only certify homes in California. We also have Green Builder, um, who certifies homes using the WRI tool, as well as Home Innovation, uh, which offers um, two different paths, either uh, going through their NGBS certification or um, also using a standalone WR uh, certification. Um, and so they, some of them are slightly different, uh, but they all have to achieve that 30% efficiency threshold that I mentioned. Once those tools um, are approved and tested by us, then they become what we refer to as a water sense approved certification method. And then this is what they use uh, to move forward to certify homes. Uh, next. Um, another big question that we get is what happens to the outdoors? So um, previously we had very specific requirements about what uh, needed to be done outdoors in terms to achieve um, water efficiency. Um, this 30% uh, requirement now adds and provides the flexibility for folks to look at the outdoors and do things, um, you know, implement strategies that are most appropriate to their region. As we know, uh, the country varies widely in terms of climate um, and landscaping needs. And so um, this really allows for builders to do what is best and what is mostly used in their market base, right? It's um, landscaping that we see in the Northeast is very di different than what we see in the Southwest. And so this is all going to be based on either um, your landscape size, the type of irrigation that you're using, your plant selection. And then of course, um, there's always uh, benefits to having commissioning by a certified professional. Uh -huh, next. So we're gonna use Utah as an example to look at what the certification, uh, how would the, the certification would behave in a, in a home in Salt Lake City. 
this is a graph from the drought monitor just showing uh, drought conditions of, of Utah since the year 2000. And we see that they have fluctuated with some, you know, the 2006, 2007 years being pretty, you know, where drought was really non-existent. But when we move over to um, 2021 and, you know, the, the more recent years, we see that the region has been hit by, by drought pretty considerably. Um, to Jonah's point, the winters um, were, were pretty good and have subsided some of that uh, drought, but we do know that it's something that we need to be aware of, especially considering the housing boom that is happening um, throughout the state, not just uh, within the metropolitan regions, but really throughout the entire state of Utah. So with that in mind, um, we really want to uh, continue to do some urban planning and some, some land planning um, and drought mitigation that is progressive and that um, is protecting our resources. Next. So this is a snapshot of one of our regional fact sheets. The regional fact sheets offer a walkthrough of what um, we would implement, what type of features would be implemented in a home, um, with the first column being a baseline home. So this is kind of what we refer to as a, a home that achieves code, um, but it's really a, a baseline. And then we go through the different iterations all the way to certification. So the first column with the baseline home, you see that the toilet, shower heads, faucets, uh, kitchen faucets are all at uh, just uh, federal, it, it meets the federal standards. Um, it's sort of the default. Then we move over to column two, which uh, is incorporating now water sense labeled products. And this is only the indoor products here. We're not considering that 30% efficiency requirement. And so we start to see some savings. Um, if you look at the bottom of the, of the table, you start to see some savings of about 14,000 gallons, um, which is five to 13% savings in comparison to that baseline home. Um, moving over to the third column, is uh, the, uh, the home uh, as it would be meeting the Utah new construction standards. As you may see, this, uh, these standards are actually um, a step back from what we would require in the mandatory checklist since they don't require that toilets are um, 1.8, but rather 1.6. So really, if you were to meet the standard, you're actually um, being less efficient than meeting the, the mandatory checklist. Um, and if you notice on all this in the landscaping, uh, we're still using turf uh, that's irrigated with standard fixed spray sprinklers and a, and a time-based time controller. So really not a lot of um, implementation there. And then finally, when you look at the fourth column, which is the example of the water sense labeled home, um, again, specific to uh, Salt Lake City, we really start to get um, to start pushing the envelope in terms of efficiency of all of the plumbing products and um, we start having our dishwashers and our pool chargers that are Energy Star certified, meaning that they are also uh, saving more water. Um, we uh, implement uh, strategies indoors, such as the uh, hot water delivery systems, um, so that we don't lose as much water at the tap when we're waiting for hot water. And then we really get into details um, in the landscaping by reducing the amount of irrigable uh, landscape that's needed um, and by diversifying uh, the, the landscape, which we'll look at in, in more detail. We also uh, start to incorporate um, label, water sense labeled uh, spray sprinkler bodies and a water sense labeled irrigation controller. Uh, next. Um, so here we'll share some graphics of what that that fourth column would actually look like. So if you're doing an efficient hot water distribution system, here are some options of what those may look like. Um, of course, this is all dependent on the type of layout that you have in your home and what would make the most sense. Next. And now we're really going to break down into that outdoor component. And so if we were to look at the landscape as a whole, this is the, the breakdown. Um, and so rather than doing all 100% turf, we're saying we're going to have, we're going to, we're saying that 20% of that turf um, is going to, it's not going to need any irrigation. And then of that 80% left, 40% is going to be irrigated with water sense labeled um, spray sprinkler bodies, and then the other 40% will be non-turf design. Uh, it will have drip irrigation. Next. 
And this is what that landscape could potentially look like, right? Um, so rather than just having a full area of um, many times non-functional turf, we can really start to beautify uh, some of these landscapes and, and backyards with having a mix of uh, plants and ground covers um, and, and really making it you know, much more attractive uh, for the homeowners. Next. Um, here we start to highlight the areas. Uh, so this would be the uh, space that does not need any irrigation. So there would be things like decks and walkways, patios. Um, again, any ground treatment that does not require irrigation. Um, I did not include in here any type of landscaping also that wouldn't. So any drought tolerant plants, um, you know, as long as it doesn't require irrigation could also meet this criteria. Next. Uh, this section of the uh, landscaping would be um, what you could plant that could be um, irrigated with simply just um, drip irrigation. So these could be things like garden beds, um, native uh, plantings, uh, and just mulched areas that uh, won't require spray or um, just large amounts of irrigation, uh, native shrub, shrubs, flower beds, etc. Next. And then finally, you have your turf um, that, you know, many homeowners enjoy having uh, having turf. And if you do have natural turf, then you have the options of, again, reducing that that turf area, uh, but then also using water sense labeled uh, irrigation products. Um, one thing that this uh, iteration of the certification did not include, but that could also uh, help you achieve that 30 percent efficiency would be having an irrigation professional. Um, come out uh, and and look over you and you know, participate in the design of your irrigation system. Uh, next. And now we'll go ahead and pass it on to Sarah to talk about um, more programs that have had success. All right. Thanks, Olga. Uh, yeah, and now I'd like to slightly switch gears. Um, really to highlight how utilities and local governments can help builders and homeowners install water efficient and climate appropriate landscapes. Uh, next slide, please. So first I'd like to start by highlighting uh, the city of Santa Rosa water. Uh, they responded initially to fire rebuild builds uh, by creating landscape plans um, that are water efficient and implement plants that are appropriate for the region. Um, these plans are really easy for builders to adopt and implement uh, because they comply with water efficient landscape ordinance, um, a local ordinance, and uh, they also walk you through the permitting process uh, to follow said ordinance. It's all kind of set up um, really nice. It's very easy, again, to adopt, and um, they list local landscape materials and suppliers uh, so you can easily connect with whomever you need to to get the appropriate materials or plants uh, to implement said, said plan. And then they also provide lists of possible plant substitutions. So say you can't find a certain plant, um, here's another plant that would be appropriate for said landscape. Um, and then they also uh, include loads of tips to reduce the risk of fire and um, just manage the landscape. So it's around for a long time. Next slide, please. And this is just a screen grab from uh, the website where they have developed these eight free scalable water efficient front yard landscape design templates. And again, these landscapes are all permit ready and you can also make site specific modifications depending on how you know, large your lot is, what shape it is. Um, and as you can see, there are several just like selectable options. They have landscapes that are focused on native uh, plants, um, really contemporary styles. They have a cottage style and then of course an eco edible style. So if you like having your own you know, food in your garden, um, a lot of variety, which is really nice. And then um, the City of Santa Rosa water website is really easy to navigate, and they have a ton of additional water efficient resources available um, that the homeowners themselves could implement as well. Uh, next slide, please. And next, I'd like to highlight Boulder County. They also uh, built a program in response to fire rebuilds. And they focused a lot on landscaping guides that minimize the risk of fire. 
And in those guidelines, they outline the recommended landscape design, plant choice, and maintenance to minimize the risk of fire damage to the home, which then, of course, also contributes to the overall control of wildfires in the area. And as you can see on the picture, they have um, kind of the landscape uh, zoned out into immediate indeterminate, or sorry, <laughs> intermediate zone, and then the extended zone. And then they have uh, outlines for how you can um, design your landscape in each of those zones to, again, protect your home, the property, and then, again, contribute to minimizing the risk of fire spreading uh, locally. And then they've also partnered with Resource Central to offer a garden kits for areas up to 200 feet. Uh, these kits are designed to replace non-functional lawn and save water and time with minimal maintenance. Uh, next slide, please. And here's another screen bag grab, uh, a, an example of one of those garden boxes. And as you can see, this one is for the curbside charm, that little slice between the curb and the sidewalk. Uh, specifically, they have several boxes available for different parts of the landscape. This is just one that I personally chose. Um, but as you can see, they have uh, a lot of really great details. Um, there's a good visual and they outline the bloom seasons of the box, the hardiness, uh, if they attract pollinators. Uh, they talk about pest resistance, which you know is important to a lot of homeowners. Uh, the height, you know, how tall they'll get. And then um, really just like, uh, or what comes with the box is a plant by number map and then care guides for the specific plants that you receive in the box. Um, and I believe this one specifically, you can see on the side has two plant by number maps. So there's also um, some variability if you wanted to follow a strict plan within the box. Uh, next slide, please. And next we have Localscapes Utah. Uh, Localscapes Utah has uh, another initiative of landscape patterns and best practices for the Utah climate. Um, these landscape designs are really easy for builders to pick up and implement and offer uh, several different designs to homeowners. Um, these landscape designs focus a lot on curb appeal, um, low maintenance, water efficiency. They utilize simple irrigation. And then they also have a huge focus on functional spaces. Uh, you can see in the image here, the five elements of a landscape and all of which contribute to curb appeal and just the functionality of the space. We wanna make sure that our landscapes have some purpose in mind and we can design them around said purpose. Uh, next slide, please. And here again, then are two examples from Local Skates Utah. Uh, you can see they have a huge variety in the amount or the type of plans that they have available. Um, on the left, you see a, a full a full landscape, um, backyard, front yard, all of it. And then on the right, you have just again that little curb strip. Um, so there's a lot of um, a lot of plans to utilize for a lot of different uh, needs, and. They're pretty detailed. They're really easy to download um, and implement. They have a large variety of plans, again, like I said, for different spaces. Um, and you can see there's really, they, they've mapped it all out. You have the spacing of different plants. They have specific plant recommendations. Uh, the website also has just local lists of plants uh, if you needed to make substitutions. Um, but really this, this is all the hard work, right? You can always, um, I think often builders and developers hire landscapers to install the landscapes themselves, but the planning is a lot of the heavy lifting, um, which is done here, which is awesome. All right, next slide, please. And finally, I think this is my last example. Uh, I would like to highlight the city of Phoenix. Uh, they also have free landscape designs available that focus on native deserts, desert space. Oh my gosh, I can't say this. Desert scapes. There we go. Uh, specifically, and which makes sense for Phoenix. Um, and in addition to landscape plans, they have a myriad of conservation initiatives and educational materials specific to desert scapes. So once we get those landscapes in the ground, we want to make sure again that they're around for for years to come. Uh, we want to protect that investment. Uh, next slide, please. And here is again uh, two examples 
of those landscape plans available with the City of Phoenix. Uh, you can see pretty much off the bat that they are definitely desert focused. Uh, they have a lot of uh, permeable services, um, uh, big trees for shade. Um, and again, these are really detailed and nice. They do all the heavy lifting for you. There's plant sizes, they've spaced the plants. Uh, they tell you what kind, their common name, how many you'll need. Um, and again, the benefits, right? We wanna protect a curb appeal and all these properties. So it's nice to know uh, when these plants will bloom, what colors uh, the blooms will be if they attract pollinators. And then they also include a list of materials in addition to the plants that you would need to complete uh, one of these projects. Uh, next slide, please. So if you are a utility or a municipality, uh, as we saw at the beginning, there are quite a few of you on the call, I definitely encourage you to poke around these programs uh, to inspire your own work uh, and encourage uh, water efficient and water wise landscaping. Uh, I think the really the main takeaway here is that municipalities and utilities have the opportunity to capitalize on working with builders, developers, landscapers, and nurseries to ensure efficient landscapes are installed from the start. Uh, as Jonah said earlier, doing uh, landscape transformation can be pretty expensive after the fact. Uh, so we really want to take the opportunity of new developments to make sure that our landscapes are easy and um, efficient from, from the get-go. And through landscape templates and manuals, uh, the landscaping design and installation process can be easily adopted and streamlined. We kind of eliminate a lot of the overwhelming choices to both builders, uh, developers, and the general public. Um, and we can do all of this while keeping the local climate and local ordinances in mind. And at the end of the day, all of this together will uh, save time, money, and most importantly, water. And I'd like to pass this back to Olga to talk about some of the resources WaterSense specifically has that you might be interested in. Yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. So um, yeah, one of the most exciting parts of the HOMES program, in my opinion, really when thinking about the WaterSense program as a whole is that with the HOMES program, we really get the opportunity to bring everything together. And so um, in HOMES, we are able to use uh, products that have been water science labeled, both indoor products and outdoor products. But we also get to incorporate um, the end user, right, and the resident and, and kind of how are they using water and analyze that residential water use. Um, and so that's really kind of the goal of the program is to, to kind of embody um, water efficiency at, at its core. And the HOMES program really, you know, does a nice job about um, incorporating all of those aspects. And so um, here we're sharing a few resources. We have many, many resources. So please feel free to <laughs> reach out if you have any specific questions that um, maybe any of these resources don't cover. But we wanted to highlight like, these specific ones. And so the first one is the WaterSense Labeled Homes Introductory Guide. This is a five-page document. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, It has a lot of graphics, uh, but it really gives you a, a good overview of the HOMES program, um, explaining everything from our HOME certification, certifi home certification organizations, um, showing you a graphic of what the checklist requires, and then as well as breaking it down uh, of certain stakeholder groups that interact uh, with our program. And if you fall into any of those stakeholder groups, you know how it is that you overlap and how it is that you can um, collaborate and participate. Participate. So a really great resource, um, sort of summarizing the, the, the program in a nutshell. So I, I really recommend um, checking that out and downloading it. Um, then next, uh, we have the Water Sense Labeled Homes Technical Reference Manual. Um, and this one um, is definitely a little bit more, uh, which shouldn't say a little bit, it's much more dense than the intro guide. But this one really uh, provides the details of um, many, um, definitely all of the mandatory requirements, um, but many other water efficiency strategies um, or systems that can be used um, and incorporated into homes, both indoors and outdoors uh, to achieve the that 30% requirement. Again, because that 30% requirement 
offers the flexibility for homes to achieve the 30% throughout the country. Um, there is a lot of uh, variability in that. And so it, it's going to depend on where you are in the country and how what strategies we pick and choose. And so this resource can really serve as a guide of what has, um, you know, where we have good data, what has proved to, to be um, helpful and, in achieving that, that 30%. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to highlight the list of within the technical reference manual. Um, I wanted to highlight the list of um, outdoor specific fact sheets that have been incorporated. Um, and so these are all outdoor strategies or systems that are specific to residential homes and that can contribute to that 30% requirement. So again, the program provides many other resources in terms of outdoors, but these that have been included in this uh, manual are specific to, um, to residential uh, applications. So you have uh, landscape design and plant selections. Um, you have soil management and mulching. Uh, spray irrigation, where we'll, you know, we talk about um, our labeled products uh, and how those can be incorporated. Um, micro irrigation, which we know uh, is is very um, efficient. Um, rain sensor sensors, um, and we'll talk about how how to install them and how to maintain. You know, so operation and maintenance is included in these fact sheets. Um, irrigation controllers. And then also we have one full fact sheet about how to work with our. Uh, certified professionals for irrigations, uh, which can support with uh, the system design, installation, or auditing uh, of any of the systems. And then, of course, we have pools and outdoor water features and how those uh, play in part. The fact sheets have various sections. And so one is, uh, the first section is understand. And so that looks into essentially just like the um, general overview of uh, what are the main highlights that you need to take into consideration when um, thinking about one of these strategies. The second uh, section um, referred to as build is really uh, targeted to our builders and how these systems should be installed um, or where in the process they should be incorporated. Um, and then the third section, which um, this actually right now it's not showing, but it would be on the back side, um, it's uh, for verifiers. And so that is a section outlining how these systems should be verified on site once they are installed and what you should be looking for when you are um, assessing the, the project um, that is being considered for a certification. Uh, next. Um, and with that, we are going to go ahead and open it for questions and discussion. I know that there have been a few questions peppered into our Q&A boxes. Um, and so I believe Jonah has volunteered to answer a few of them. Um, so Jonah, if you want to um, go ahead and hop on and uh, answer those. Awesome, thank you everyone. I am gonna launch a quick poll question. So if you have some questions that you wanna type into that Q&A box, please do so now. Um, otherwise, or at the same time, please let us know if you would like to attend or like an attendance uh, certificate for this webinar. Um, I'm gonna leave this poll open until we get to pretty much 100%. And I'm also gonna go ahead and open up our questions that we've got. So the first one I see is, how do the boxes relate to stormwater issues with the sides or do the boxes not interfere? I think this question is for Sarah. So I see you're typing yeah. your response as well. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna send something, but I, I couldn't type fast enough, but this is fine. <laughs> um, uh, well, the Stormbox program is in the city of Boulder, which is primarily an arid environment. Um, to my knowledge, they don't have huge, huge stormwater issues. Uh, I'm sure they have like first, flush sort of issues. Um, from what I saw, from what I remember, I don't think they have a specific like rain garden box. I think that's a great idea if utilities wanted to implement something like that, especially if you have stormwater issues. Um, but yeah, really these, these programs, they kind of address the needs of whatever is needed locally. And my assumption is that if they don't address stormwater in these boxes, it's not the, the highest, most pressing issue. I think 
um, especially that program, I think it is primarily focused on removing non-functional -fun turf grass. So like the example I showed was that little strip of, uh, of what's usually turf grass between a sidewalk and the street. And instead of turf grass, we have um, often native plants, definitely low water use plants that um, would hopefully require little to no supplemental irrigation. Um, so the idea is just low maintenance, low water use. Um, but yeah, if, if stormwater is an issue, I think that's an excellent idea to implement um, if you're a local municipality or utility. I hope that answers the question. I think that sometimes it would interfere, but sometimes it wouldn't. It just depends. Um, yeah, which is the great part about um, utilizing these kind of programs. If you are a utility or a municipality, you can do something very focused on your local environment and your needs as a national program. We obviously don't have that kind of flexibility. So that's why we partner with y'all. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question I see is, has EPA considered targeting limited but targeted regional programs for water sense homes similar to the Energy Star program? For example, Florida uses more than 50% of residential potable water use for irrigation. Uh, yeah, Katie, I'd, I'd be happy to take that one. Um, so our 30% requirement does adjust to the climate, um, and we uh, look at that very carefully in our evaluation process. So in other words, we don't allow uh, an HCO to go forward and start certifying homes unless we're 100% certain that their, uh, their method of measuring water use is going to appropriately adjust to the fact that 50% of residential water use in Florida is used for homes. Because again, that's that's actually very clear to see from the climate indicators that we get from that we get from Florida. So the program does adjust in that way to local to local climate. Uh, one thing we do not do, similar to Energy Star, that we evaluated very carefully, is in Energy Star certified homes, the uh, the reference home that baseline. Uh, will adjust based on the climate zone and the uh, prevailing state code. Um, we looked at doing something similar in, in water. We decided against it for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, um, a lot of what we do see in state codes, if they exist in state requirements, if we exist on um, plumbing products, really just mirrors what we see in the mandatory checklist. Um, so since everyone has to do the mandatory checklist to get a water sense labeled home, it sort of evens the playing field. Um, the other uh, reason is we, we know from our friends at Energy Star that that introduced that type of variability introduces an immense amount of complexity uh, to the system. And when we crunched the numbers and did the math, again, knowing that the, the playing field was going to be leveled by the presence of the mandatory checklist with all homes have to do as a base measure um, before they can really even start to pursue the water sense label for homes, um, the difference was really pretty small. So um, we, we do adjust uh, for, for, for climate, but we do it uh, by, by taking those climate factors into account, not by doing sort of separate programs on a state or, or climate region basis. Awesome, thank you. It looks like the next question is for you as well. And the question is, what is the average cost to certify using ResNet or another provider? And is there any cost information related to the expense to build a water sense home and yard? What is the increase uh, to construction costs? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I hear, and then I'll throw it to Olga to see if she has any um, uh, anything to add. Uh, people do get a little sensitive when we talk about costs. What I, what I can tell you is what we hear from uh, from from raiders, from uh, home verifiers that work under ResNet uh, consistently is. Uh, once they really figure out the ins and outs of, of doing uh, the, the, the site verification, um, uh, it takes them uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 minutes to an hour. Of course, the first one takes a lot longer. Like anything else, there's a little bit of a learning curve. But once you get into the process, um, and again, one of the reasons we set up the program the way that we did was because typically this is a, a 45 minutes to an hour of a site visit that they're adding on to a site visit they were already doing. So we're minimizing truck rolls, we're already using uh, a, a verifier that was on site. We're just extending their time there a little bit. And I think you can probably draw your own conclusions about how much that, that costs um, uh, exactly. Um, as far as the incremental cost for outdoor um, and, and landscape uh, measures, 
That's a little bit of a difficult question to answer because it really depends on where the, where the builder is starting from. Um, a lot of builders that uh, were maybe already in the practice of really building high performance homes and were already looking at uh, water efficiency in a, in a cohesive way, but needed to make a few fine tuning, you know, fine tune a little bit, make some adjustments. A lot of them really are able to, to achieve the certification with no cost, low cost uh, uh, changes or just efficiencies that they're able to identify by looking more broadly at the at their building process. Um, you know, on the flip side, we we also work with builders who aren't in the practice of installing any landscape at all, and then it's sort of all additional cost uh, for them. So it really depends on where the on where the builder is 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 starting. Um, if they're you know already de delivering pretty good landscapes, then it's not that that big of a lift. If they're not, then unfortunately for them, it is. But again, we we kind of feel like that's appropriate because we just have more work to do with that builder. I know Olga, I don't know if you if you have. Uh, other experiences or have heard other things from from verifiers um no i think i i, I would you know everything that you said aligns the only thing i would add is that we do see more and more um either utilities or jurisdictions offering uh incentives um in various manners um to either install appropriate or you know water efficient landscapes or even to like swap out lawns and so that does vary from region to region and state to state you know some states have more incentives that other but we do see that um it's starting to pick up and we do see more you know folks getting themselves on that list so i think wherever you're in the region feel free to you know uh, either do a quick google search or even reach out to us um and we're you know we're happy to help you navigate um and maybe identify if there's any programs in, in any of the regions where you are uh, yeah, and I, I do see a comment from uh, from my friend friend Lorene, which is more of a more of a uh, I think a a note, but it's a good one um, that if you're especially dealing with a custom home that has a more complicated landscape, that can that very much can increase the the cost of the verification and the the amount of time that the that the verifier has to spend on the project, um, and that's true indoors as well, right? It's um, you know I always when I'm in the energy world, I I do liken it to. Uh, to a hers rating or an energy rating they you know most of them are relatively straightforward but if you want to get complicated with it it can get complicated in, in a hurry um so that's a good reminder thank, thank you for that lorraine awesome thank you both uh the next question i see is do you see cities and governments requiring new homes to have water sense labeling for all new developments Yeah, I'll, I'll, again, I'll take first stab and then let you have a crack at it, Olga. Um, uh, we, we are starting to see uh, more of this. Um, I think the, the most prominent example that um, that we see at the moment is uh, from the city of Phoenix, um, where they've actually adopted a policy where it, it is the, um, uh, the uh, sort of baseline uh, practice in their zoning policy. Um, so when you go to have a new uh, to have a new development zoned within the city of Phoenix, requiring uh, water sense certification um, as one of the conditions of approval is sort of where they start. Um, we also see either rebates or requirements that happen all the way on the other end, right? That says, well, you know, bring us. As Olga mentioned um, uh, one of these. Bring us the certification, which happens literally right before right before the home is occupied, and we'll give you uh, a rebate on those homes and, and we see everything uh, in between. The one thing I will say that um, uh, we see we we see a lot of, but it's very difficult for us to track, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is places that uh, mirror our requirements, but don't necessarily require the certification. And those are a little bit tricky for us to, to deal with. Um, they're difficult for us to track because we don't get any feedback. Uh, on them. Uh, we're not big fans of them because we think there is tremendous value to the actual certification process. Uh, but more than anything, what happens a lot of times is that the community or the utility will come to us after the fact with a problem and say, hey, can you help with this? And, and unfortunately, the answer is no, we can't because we don't have any control over those homes. As long as they're certified and they're put through our certification program, we have this sort of whole array of tools at our disposal, right? We can we can pull files from the HCO. We can add them to QA requirements. Um, right? We have these different tools that we can use to go back and check on the houses and see what it happened, what has ha what's happened to them, and and why they and and if they're performing the way that that we wanted them to. Whereas if it's just a requirement, then we can't really do any of that. 
Yeah. Um, and I'll just add to that, um, beyond even uh, city or government requirements, we have seen developers starting to adopt um, the the certification on their own, just uh, sort of a, you know, along the lines of, of the ESG reporting and, and kind of um, shifting into making this um, the standard rather than like the green building, uh, you know, or, or high performance world. So um, there's a big development um, that is being planned out of Phoenix, um, in a town uh, called Buckeye, where, um, you know, it's being developed by Howard Hughes, over 100,000 uh, uh, units, um, and they have committed to, to doing uh, all water sense homes. So we're, we're very excited to see that. Um, and then we uh, the, have also, um, Eris Park has also been a community that has done um, all water sense, has committed to all water sense. So we are seeing more developers, you know, they're larger scale committing. Um, and we have builder partners that have also committed to doing sort of their uh, div regional divisions that have committed to fully going with water sense. So we're seeing it from both, from both ends um, and hoping that, you know, that, that can only uh, increase the numbers even more. Awesome, thank you. And I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, and I see it is right here. So it is here in Connecticut, we are struggling with ensuring that our municipal, regional and community utilities can encourage conservation while still meeting revenue requirements. Is the EPA also looking at revenue challenges and water affordability that may be unintended consequences of promoting water sets? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll take that question in, in, in two parts. Um, uh, I'll deal with uh, um, uh, revenue and affordability as one. That's something the agency is looking at uh, more broadly, very seriously, and, and, and really spending a lot of time, uh, and as well as directing some of the resources that are available to us uh, from some of the big legislation that have passed within the within the couple of years. So it's a it's a priority for the agency as a whole. And we have people in this building here that are working very hard on that. Um, but also, I want to address the, the idea that when you when you use water more efficiently, you're decreasing revenues. Um, uh, and that uh, means that you know ultimately that presents uh, cost challenges for, for the utility, which is very fair. Um, and a lot of times the complaint comes out as, well, you asked us to, to conserve water, we conserved water, now you're raising my rates. Again, that's a very fair response, but the fact of the matter is it's a little bit of a, of, of a, of, uh, a misleading statement because rates were always going to go up, right? It's like death taxes and your water rates are going to go up. Those are the facts in life, right? Um, numerous studies have shown that long-term reducing water use lowers rates over, over the course of the uh, lifespan of a system, right? So um, the reason for that is that it's more cost effective to reduce consumption rather than having to expand infrastructure and get and get additional, additional sources. So um, even though we're, we're aware that uh, reducing uh, revenue from reduced usage does pose some very uh, stri striking challenges, um, again, it's been been shown uh, through, through multiple studies that long term systems actually do benefit from reduction in consumption. Awesome, thank you. I'll turn it over to Sarah. Cool, thank you. Uh, thank you for all those uh, really insightful and thoughtful questions. We really appreciate getting good, engaging questions. Oh, looks like you're muted. Oh, am I? <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I'll, I'll backtrack. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Uh, we really love getting uh, thoughtful and insightful questions because um, we like we like talking about you know what we choose to highlight on our webinars. And I know we're a little over, so if you're still with us, thank you for hanging around. Um, and before we go, if you are New to WaterSense, uh, I would like to inform all of you that uh, WaterSense is a voluntary partnership pr program uh, with the EPA, and we would not be successful without our over 2,000 partners. Um, and we partner with manufacturers, retailers, distributors, builders, uh, certification providers, professional certifi certifying organizations, and promotional partners. Uh, if any of those somewhat define you, 
Um, I encourage you all to go to our website and consider becoming a partner. Uh, next slide. Uh, here is where you can go and become a partner, um, learn about uh, what partnership can do for you. Uh, and again, we really love all the work that our partners do. We couldn't do this work without them. Uh, being a WaterSense partner is free. Uh, so again, I encourage you all to go check out our website and just see, see what WaterSense is about. We'd love to have you and, um, and work with you. And that's all. So thank you for joining us.